decision. Uh, Sudip Sen has just given me his, the book he has come out with, an anthology. So I'd start with reading a poem uh, from that. It is called World English Poetry. I think it was published in my third or the fourth book. A takeoff on a passing remark. Tall buildings impress me. The ones which cut off half the sky. I like tall stories, even though false. Not the half truth sleeping with the half lie. I want things on a large scale, amplitudes, a sense of space and light, the great yellow eye of the train lighting up the distances of the night, urchins, furred caterpillars, moles, and fern beds are all right. But I want flowering trees, long streamers of moss, flaming parasites. But when you ask, still squirrel young, about uh, short as twilight, short as a shadow at noon, why I love you, what can I say? Uh, I should have marked my poems, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll read two Sappho poems. You know, she was in the island of Lesbos and one of the greatest uh, Greek poets and everyone tries his hand at Sappho. Uh, when I was in college I, or in university, I still remember a translation. Sleepless, it's not mine. Sleepless I gaze, the flame within runs swift over all my quivering skin. My eyeballs fail, flame with dizzy din, my brain reels round. And cold drops fall and tremblings frail sees every limb and grassy pale I grow and then together fail both sight and sound. Uh, the special thing about the sapphic stanza is that the first three lines will be of eight syllables and the fourth line will be of four syllables. So I go to one minute if you don't mind. I'm sorry. Sappho to Aphrodite. Slightly long. There is a shorter one also. I'll read both. Long and lonely, and she was, uh, you know, the word lesbian comes from Lesbos, the island which she inhabited. But she was in love with uh, both a woman, Conjilla, and then also with a man. Long and lonely are my nights. Come help me, goddess, end my blight. Her absence burns me, burns my sides with love intense. Aphrodite, hail or sleet, I implore you, to come down from Crete. My altar smokes awaits your feet with frankincense. Your love demented Sappho pleads, give me no manna and no mead. It's love, not wine, that Sappho needs. You understand, I haven't had a word from her. Once again, make her my lover. In bed and bar, her breast should flower in my hands. Her star erasing beauty spell turns me feverish, frail, unwell. Her presence is both bliss and hell. I tremble so. Her absence scars my empty flank, 
Goddess, you don't need my verse to tell you this. My love is frank. I can't dissemble. So, bring back Gonjila to my side. May she once more become my bride. May she, her lyre and her fire, beside me purr. Come foam born and cypress born, goddess of love and the love lawn. My altar awaits you with fire urn, incense and myrrh. And a small poem of, by her, when she goes old. It's quite different. Goddess, I'm lonely now. Goddess, I'm lonely now. A tragic harvest in your net. The Pleiades and the moon have set. I sleep alone. Love's delirium does not last. I've learned that lesson from the past. The emptiness that follows lust scars me to the bone. Love's desertions, they are swift as star clusters incline and shift. My lovers like Orion drift. I drift alone. Uh, I'll read one more from this. And uh, this is called The Miracle. I was writing very bleak poems and things happened when I should have written bleak poems, but I rather chose to write a poem on the miracle of the millennium. The miracle of the dawn prayer, gold in its hair, and of the vespers, lamp black after dusk, this estuary marked with gulls, the sea there as always, and the harbor swarming with schooner and sailboat, rudders, masts, and hulls. Brittle coral, firm as rock, Thick smell of frying fish. The lighthouse so wrapped in history, it forgot to turn on the light. But constellations switch on their mysteries as the magi fish for omens. Sing hymns celebratory. Forget sickness, blight. The wonder of the calendar that makes us forget the years are seamless. Come on, turn the page. This miracle, the world dragged by time's oxen into another furrow, another seedbed, another age. I'll read a few new poems, if I may. I we took four Scorpios and did the Himalayas in 2003. 78 days and we did the entire Himalayas from the Siachen Glacier through Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, Garhwal, Kumau, right up to uh, Kibitu and then the Naga Hills, but the Naga Hills are not, uh, are not Himalayas. And I was asked something and my answer came, and the poem is called, What Lights Up? What lights up the light bulb filaments of your recall, old man? This streak of fire through the thin wire of memory and mind. What line from which poet? The ibex looking down quizzically at our car from the cliff. The crock sunning corrugated hide on the banks of the Rapti as I cross the river, rolling on elephant back, weary elephant treating riverbed like a mine, trundling diagonal across the current and red-robed monk slowing life down, not through asanas, 
but with mumbled prayer that slow rolls the cylindrical prayer drum and stars at their night shift in Ladakh. I don't remember the dripping, deciduous word leaf, word leaf, huh? not word leaf. I'll read that again, sorry. I don't remember the dripping, deciduous word leaf, holistic, halfway through its never ending fall from the tree of knowledge. And your eyes, I remember them bright as a window of a just lit room seen from the cinder dark outside the black moment cinder dark that was I at that moment. Sad, isn't it? Not a bit. The spyglass getting hazed in the cold as it peeps into the mist and melancholy of the gone by Guzishta, Urdu word for the past, memory, sabotaging memory, past, subverting past. And two more, if I may. Also from the new ones, yes, Naropa's wife. You've heard of Naropa, or you may not. Great Bengali saint turned Buddhist and became uh, one of the great Milarepa and Naropa are the two great saints. Went to Tibet. I believe his uh, remains are in a Gompa in the Zanskar Valley. I have written a story about Naropa also. And this is his wife, just like the Lord Buddha. He also left his wife after eight years of a very happy married life. And he told her that uh, I'll tell our parents, the, the parents of both bride and uh, both husband and wife were alive, uh, that women are deception and women are bad. Uh, women he thought were bad for the road to Nirvana. I think... Uh, India has this belief, and the old Christians had celibacy also. But many other religions uh, certainly have nothing against sex uh, as far as uh, reaching uh, near the divine is concerned. Uh, Parsis have nothing. Uh, Islam has nothing about celibacy either. And this is a monologue on behalf of Naropa's wife. I never heard of the soul's call. Not even when I married him at 16. Bird calls and the call of the heart. Yes, but not this. Eight years he reveled in my body and my love. Then I noticed his heart. Or was it his soul? I'm getting confused. Withdrawing, I could feel the spasms of his coiled silences, the call of a nowhere near nirvana got to him, and the call of the ochre dust, not bits like the prayer wheel, but meditation, trance, dharma, penance, Dangerous words, all. One day he said, I must leave. I was used to his talk of ephemera and illusion. The two words knotted in such a tangle that I didn't know which was which. I will say to the world, he went on, that women only beguile. They are swamp deception. When he spoke these very words to our parents, I echoed him. He was preaching, not making excuses. 
to his parents and his in-laws. I'll read that again. I echoed him. He was preaching, not making excuses. Illusion and ephemera walked in again as ever. I lowered my head and said I was worthless. He took the road. I took the goat track to solitude. But my solitude was not ephemera. And one last. I think I would start by saying, let's wake up a little bit. I think uh, all poets, even if in Mushaira we are saying that in Urdu poetry, uh, we don't want Mukarrar again and again and all Ishad, etc. At least our own tradition of listening to poetry should mean that there's some enthusiasm. Let's, it's a cold, gray um, evening. So let's uh, put some jaan into this evening, I think. So uh, I don't think it would be a bad idea to, you know, wherever you don't like it, you just boo me out. Or if you like it, if you like a poem, then maybe you can do a little bit of clapping or something, you know, so that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, I will read uh, from two or three volumes of mine. we we'll start with uh, maybe, uh, start with a poem from Dreamcatcher, which is my latest po uh, book of poems. And I'll read a poem which is actually about dreams uh, in one sense. Um, this is called Many a Moment. In my wakeful moments, my eyes close to keep my dreams alive. Trees find roots in the skies their arms digging into the center of the earth, my eyes flapping, lapping the taste of fruit. In the feathery moonlight, snowflakes pat rainbows on my skin over the river of fire, of flapping tongues of red into yellow, frozen memory unwinding on the screen of my eyelids, white and black robes twirling in circles, the cold face of Mwangi, black bewildered night, eyes twinkling, lips spouting as mushrooms, palms large as river basins, sliding down my spine, I frolicking and just nine, with chocolate melting into my mouth, rolling down the cloud, doing goma ball after ball, caught in the net, the helpless stick in my hands, at the far end the flailing freckled white arms of the PT ma'am. I, never a keeper of goals, swimming in deep waters I drown again and yet again but come afloat always, humming the songs of ancestors, smell the first rain on the parched earth and feel the heartthrob of babies yet to be conceived. Thank you. Thank you. To continue in the same mood and go for the poem which is called Dreamcatcher. I must reach the forest in time before the break of dawn each day to pick some dreams scattered in misty darkness. I must reach before the sun crackles through the leaves of the trees on which dreams pile up, perching on the branches through the night. Dreams half dreamt, fully dreamt, like babies born and unborn, crying out for attention, making weird faces in sleep. I pick what gets my fancy, bits from my wrinkled past, the shadowy fragments mixing in twilight, droplets of dew ready to vanish with sunrise. Each day I come home with a bag full of dreams that drip through the day. For me and all, each night I wait for the new dawn. I have been very privileged in getting translated by uh, Gulzar Sab. And I don't think it's fair not to read the translation also of a, of a poem that he did. 
um, which is uh, included in poems Come Home. I will read the English and then the uh, Hindustani translation. Talking aloud, my Chinar, where is that peer? Remember? How in the white silence of the winters our songs formed a rainbow and the peer rose from heaps of pythons, roots twisting and turning around the great grandfather oak, that great Sufi, the witness with long thick hair, waves of fulfilled desires, wishes in tangles of a hundred beards, a living monument, young with passion, old in wisdom, Observing you, my Chinar, year after year, your leafless arms stretching out to me through biting wafts of mountain breeze, remember? There were then neither those fences nor borders, but just horizons beyond the sadness of valleys. No. I will read the uh, translation now and see what the effect is because uh, I'm always intrigued. Uh, as to how to adjudge this translation. Chinar mere, kahan gya peer? Yaad hai na? Safed khamoshi sardiyon ki humare nagmok se banti thi ek saath rangi aur peer utte the dher se un ajgaro se balon pe bal khati un jadon se lapet lete the ok dadu ko sorry लपेट लेते थे ओक दादू को गिर्द अपने अजीम सूफी घनी जटाओं में गुंत जाती थी आरजुएं वो जिंदा एक यादगार था जमा था जज्बों में बुजुर्ग दानिश में वो सालह साल तक मुझे देखता रहा चिनार मेरे बगैर पत्तों के बाहें तेरी बढ़ाता था जब मेरी तरफ तू पहाड़ी बर्फाव हवा के झोंकों में याद है ना नहीं थी उस वक्त हदूदी तारें न सरहदें थी उफूक ही थे बस उदास इन वादियों के आगे आई कैन नॉट इमिटेट हिम बट विद हिज वॉइस एंड द रिदम दैट ही गेव टू दिस पोएम द ट्रांसलेशन एक्चुअली मेक्स द पोएम बेटर सो दे कैन बी गेन्स इन ट्रांसलेशन ऑल्सो so a uh, couple of poems more uh, dolly would that be fine all right so i'll read a poem which is um um been published in a book which unfortunately hasn't gone around too much my publisher is sitting here and i blame him not my poetry this is a volume that is called uh, untitled and um, maybe that is the reason why it's not going around but i think he's uh, he's done a good job the publication is pretty good the the painting is mine on the cover uh, this is an old poem but published recently guru trees are yogis standing erect erect on their roots exuding an aura of unrelatedness each one is one and content swinging proudly in the silent music of the gentle breeze meditating into a state of thoughtfulness sometimes thoughtlessness and blowing its spiritual breath into every little leaf on its being at noon it throws its cool shadow for the earth to rest in peace the yogi does not participate in his glory the tropical summer cannot comprehend the glorious freshness the tree shoots upwards in an aimless search its height giving it giving it a vital security in the soil the distant exuberance of the sun is dimmed by the yogi i have one in my compound i inhale its philosophy power and light for my own branches roots and leaves the last one which um, why should i not read it again and again because i like this poem whenever i miss my 
daughter, I read it again and again. She's right now in the States. Mothers and Daughters is what it's called. You've heard it many times, I'm sure, right? In the wardrobe of my child today, I found my baby journeying into adolescence away from innocence buried deep in the middle shelf behind heaps of vests and underwears. Innocence lying crouched and discarded in rolled up garments too small for her now. Just the other day, and that's a year ago, on her birthday she was in the skirt so small, so frilly, and this t-shirt with butterflies flying out of its fabric, and now so garish, Mama, that, my child, was your own frolicking little being, flying with the butterflies, a full bud now, ready to burst and express, its, express herself through menstruation and breasts, a body twisting and turning into new forms, disconnecting from old clothes, locating fresh autumns, springs, the deep blue skies, unknown directions, pathless coals, and distance with no horizons, sifting and picking her own roots. Entwined in mine, she grows her own branches, acquiring her own shadow. I see it all, the wide open wardrobe, unblinking eyes, my mother with her shadow, I with mine, and my daughter discovering and stepping into hers. All the three shadows are alike, and the umbilical cord unsevered. Thank you. So Keiki took us to the landscape of Ladakh, and uh, this is close to Ladakh, a place called Kargil. And when I read the poem, you'll know the context. It opens with this fabulous poet called uh, Derek Walcott. And this particular epigraph is from his uh, book-length poem called Theopolo's Hound. Our street of smoke and fences, gutters gorged with weed and reeking, scorching iron grooves of rusted galvanize a dialect forged from burning asphalt and a sky that moves with thunderhead cumuli grumbling with rain. Ten years on, I came searching for war signs of the past, expecting remnants, magazine debris, unexploded shells, shrapnels that mark bomb wounds. I came looking for ghosts, people pass, skeletons charred, abandoned brick, wood, cement that once housed them. I could only find whispers, whispers among the clamor of a small town outpost in full throttle, everyday chores catching outward signs of normalcy and life. In that bustle, I spot war lines of a decade ago though the storylines are kept buried, wrapped in old newsprint. There's order amid uneasiness, the mirzans cry, the monks chant, baritones merging in their separateness. At the bus station, black coughs of exhaust smokescreen everything, the roads meet, and after the crossroad ritual diverge, skating along the undotted lines of control. A porous garland with cracked beads adorns Tiger Hill. Beyond the mountains are dark memories, and beyond them, no one knows. And beyond them, no one wants to know. Even the flight of birds that wing over their crests don't know which feathers to down. Chameleon-like, they fly, Tracing perfect parabolas, I look up and calculate their exact arc and find instead a flawed theorem. Today is my mother's birthday, so I thought it would be appropriate to read a poem for her. Um, 
It's a, it's a poem I wrote about three years ago when I lost my mother. And um, the problem with death in a place like India, and especially Delhi, with the kind of bureaucracy we have is we do not get any time to grieve. And why is that? Uh, my mother died, and for the first 15 days after her death, all I was doing was going to the municipal offices, chasing down death certificates and so on, because without that, you can't progress with basic things like burial and so on. So even though it's an uh, elegy, it is a comment on the kind of bureaucratic space we live in. It's a short poem. Ma, is it possible for people to shut up at the outside or is it part of the scenario? I think it's background noise, right? It's good for you. Ma, as if in a dream, you disappeared unannounced, untimely, and unprepared. The handwritten diary you left behind weepingly revealed your sordid, searing pain. Grief struck, I run around the city's municipal offices, rummaging through bureaucratic files, seeking your death certificate for validation, as if losing you wasn't lost enough. Thank you. On a more cheery note, uh, this is a poem written for a friend of mine who I actually suddenly spot in the audience. So I'm going to read it um, and see what happens. This is called Silence. Silence has its own subtle color. Between each breath pause, heat simmers, latent saliva, tongue entwined lisp. Here and there, errant clouds wait, yearning for rain. Desire melting, even silence to words. Words color, bleed, incarnadine as your lips whisper softly the secrets of your silence. Your fine chicken blouse, white, sheer, and almost transparent, cannot hide the quiet of your heartbeat on your wheat olive skin. The milk white flower adorning your hair sheds a solitary petal, just one. In that petal, silence blooms color, white, transparent white, pure white silence. Thank you, very, very kind. Uh, since we finally have winter in Delhi, I was yearning for winter till about a week ago. It was, uh, I had the fan on till about a week ago, and thankfully, this is the winter we know Delhi winters ought to be like. So therefore, a poem called Winter, written in Delhi. A lot of my poetry landscape either comes from the Bengali tradition, the Bangla tradition, which is one of my mother tongues, or Delhi very specifically, which is where I'm born and brought up and grew up all my life. And this one is, uh, will warm people who are dog lovers and cat lovers. I'm not one of them. <laughs> Winter. Couched on crimson cushions, pink bleeds gold, and red spills into one's heart. Broad leather keeps time, calibrating different hours in different zones, unaware of the grammar that makes sense. Only random woofs and snows of two distant dogs on a very cold night clears fog that is unresolved. New plants wait for new heat to grow, to mature. An old cane recliner contains poetry for peace, woven text keeping comfort in place. 
But it is this impatience of want that keeps equations unsolved. Heavy, translucent, vaporous, split red by mother tongues, winter's breath is pink. So I have three mother tongues, Bangla, Hindi, and English. I also translate from Urdu. I translate a lot from these languages. Uh, Urdu, of course, I have to admit that I translate, uh, re I read Urdu in Devnagri script, which is possible. Um, this is a poem by uh, a Bengali poet. Many of you may, have, may know this poem. Uh, the poet in uh, question, his name is Jibananondo Dash, uh, a very, very fine modernist poet. Growing up in Delhi and growing up in a Bengali family, Tagore was losing out of every orifice to the point that I actually had a real distaste and uh, I was quite anti-Tagore until I was a bit more mature. And then, of course, I've translated Tagore greatly. But the poets I liked when I was growing up were people like Jivanand Dash, Kazi Nazrul Islam, Ghaleb, Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Those were the gods for me. And this is a very, very famous poem called Bonolata Shen. Anybody who knows Bengali probably will know the original. And uh, it's been translated many, many, many times by various people. And this is my uh, version. One of the things I found when I read the translations of various uh, people was the content was correct. The story told was replicated correctly. But the rosh, the ras, the cadence in Bangla was just not there in the English versions. So this is actually maps the intonation and the rhyme scheme and the cadence of the original Bangla into English. Jivanandu Dash's Bonolata Shen. Sadly not my relative because I'm completely in love with this woman. For a thousand years I walked this earth's passage by day and night. From Lanka's shores to Malay's vast seas I've traveled much been a guest at Bimbishar and at Ashok's courts, stayed in the distant nights in the town of Bidharbo. I'm long worn out. Around me, waters of sea and life have endlessly swirled. My only peace, a fleeting moment snatched with her, Natorer Bonolata Shen. Chultar, Kabekar, Andhokar, Bidishar, Nisha, like the dense ink night of Bidisha, her hair black, deep black, her face like the delicate weave of Shrabosti's filigree frieze. Just as a lost boatman, rudderless, wow, yes, the poem like this can blow the electricity off. You know. <laughs> Just as a lost boatman, rudderless, tossing in the far seas, chances upon a lush green isle of spice, I too caught a sight, saw her, a mere glimpse in the dark, gently raising her eyes like a bird's nest, she whispered, where were you all this while? And there she stands at my dream's end, my own Bonolata Shen. With soft settling hiss of dew, evening closes the day's end. Kites erase from their wings sun-stained smell of flight. When colors of the earth gently fade, fireflies light up their palette, and old songs find new lyric, old stories new score. Birds return home, so do the rivers, as life strayed its give and take ceases. Only the dark stays, and just as it remains, so does sitting by my side, face to face, my own Bonolata Shen. And since there are so many Gulzar aficionados, including uh, Sukrita, who read 
Gulzar's poems, and Gulzar has translated uh, Sukrata. I've also translated a bunch of Gulzar's poems, and I'll read you a short one. It's impossible, as she said, to replicate Gulzar Saab's hugely baritonous voice, his starch, crisp white kurta, and his jutis, which are gold and prongs back to you. you know. um, impossible to replicate all that. But this is a beautiful poem. Um, this is called Sketch. It's actually called Sketch, even in Urdu. But um, there's nothing like reading this in Urdu. Sketch by Gulzar. Do you recall that day when you sat at my table on a cigarette pack, a small sapling sketch you had made? Come here, see, on that plant now, flowers appear. And I'll end with a poem called Banyan. And this banyan tree actually is in my grandparents' house in Bengal, uh, who I used to visit and spend a good month, month and a half every, every year in my youth. Uh, of course, in Delhi, I have a house which has a plot which can't even take a, you know, uh, a marigold plant. So I've transplanted this big banyan tree into my garden, and it's in my imagination this banyan grows. Of course, if you go to Sanskriti Foundation uh, just outside Delhi in Anandgram, as you enter the gates, there's this wonderfully beautiful banyan tree with its tertiary roots going all over the place. So I suppose you know, Delhi does boast of one well-kept banyan tree. This is my own, not yours, this one. And I'll end with this. As winter secrets melt with the purple sun, what is revealed is electric. Notes tune unknown scales, syntax alters tongues. Terracotta melts white. Banyan ribbons into armatures as branch roots twist, meeting soil in a circle. Circuits glazed under cloth carry alphabets for a calligrapher's nib italicized in invisible ink, letters never posted, cartographer's map uncharted, as phrases fold, so do veils. Many thanks.